Hello everyone, my name is Emmanuel Attanasio from the Italian National Tourist Board. I'm very excited to present this session featuring Graham Turner, founder and CEO of Flight Centre Travel Group. Graham will explain how Flight Centre is recovering and rebuilding from the impact of COVID-19. And he will also talk about many of the big issues that the travel industry is facing. So please sit back, get comfortable and enjoy the session. Hello and welcome to Travel Days 2020, presented by the Italian National Tourist Board. I'm Huntley Mitchell, editor of Travel Weekly, and before we kick off proceedings, I want to let you know about a few house rules. You should be able to see the chat function on the right-hand side of your screen. Feel free to use this to communicate with your fellow attendees during each session. However, our moderator will boot anyone out who uses this inappropriately. So one strike and you're out. If you do decide to share anything Travel Days related on social media, make sure you include the hashtags Travel Days and Travel Days 2020. We'll also be sharing a simple feedback poll at the end of the session, so please let us know what you think before you leave. Now, I'd like to introduce our speaker for this session. Known to many in the travel industry simply as Screw, Graeme Turner is the founder of the ASX listed Flight Centre Travel Group. Welcome, mate, and thank you very much for taking the time to have a chat. Thank you, Hartley. No pleasure, no, no problem. Excellent. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the Flight Centre's path to recovery from COVID-19, as well as address some of the big picture questions that may, uh, many in the industry are seeking answers to. So, screw, let's uh, dive straight in, shall we? For sure, yes. Excellent. So... First thing I wanted to talk about, obviously, uh, Flight Centre has been forced to make uh, many tough business decisions as a result of COVID-19, including redundancies, retail store closures, um, sold the company's Melbourne office, and um, you closed and integrated multiple brands. Do you expect to make more of these types of tough decisions in the near future, or are you kind of out of the woods now? Well, we're certainly not out of the woods. Uh, bear in mind, uh, you know, Flight Centre operates our own businesses in 23 different countries, so it does vary quite a bit where we are. Uh, you know, for example, in France, we have a quite a big operation and uh, there's a lot of government support there. We're getting back to a break, you know, pretty close to a break even there. And, and uh, even South Africa's not bad. They're, they're now flying domestically and some international destinations. So it varies quite a lot from country to country, but um, generally I'd say we've made most of the major decisions we've had to. And our main thing in the future, we hope, is to be able to bring back more people that generally by now or within the next few weeks uh, were originally stood down, but have generally now been made redundant so they can get on with their lives uh, get another job until we're ready to take them back. Um, indeed, if if they will come back at that stage, of course. Uh, Screw. Would you agree that uh, these dramatic changes to flight centres' business model were already needed, and, and that COVID nineteen has just brought them forward? Yeah. Look, there's quite there's an element of that, and uh, if uh, if there is ever any silver lining in this uh, pandemic or uh, more effective the uh, government restrictions that ha have followed the pandemic. Um, from, from our point of view in, in leisure, we've, um, we had, uh, we've gone, for example, in uh, Australia from 950 uh, locations in leisure to somewhere around the 400 mark. Um, it still means that we've got uh, plenty of locations to service our customers. We believe we can get back to most of that pre-COVID level with those number of locations, particularly with more of a focus on the online travel call centres as well as, uh, you know, the um, independent contractor uh, as well as our frontline um, shops, uh, which, you know, the, the ones we've kept are obviously the best ones, the best positioned ones, the larger ones that can take um, more of our uh, frontline people in them as well. Uh, and obviously, we have technology that we can put into play much more easily uh, during, uh, you know, much lesser volume of, of business during this time. So there are some sort of linings in being able to change the mix of our models a little bit. Uh, and the same in corporate. Uh, corporate, 
will be about a lot more productivity, a lot to do with some of the, um, you know, the technology platforms that we've been developing and we've been fast-tracking since uh, COVID uh, hit, fast-tracking particularly in the implementation and deployment of them. So, yeah, there are some, as I said, some silver lining to it, but uh, prefer to be able to do it in other ways rather than having a pandemic making us do it. Obviously, you just chatted there before about technology. Um, it seems to be quite a big focus for Flight Centre right now. Uh, you recently acquired Where2 uh, and you also set up some partnerships with Vivint and um, Trevello. What, what other ways is the company planning to evolve its tech credentials? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think we are taking this opportunity to roll out some platforms, both in leisure and in corporate. And obviously, when your business is down um, 85, 90, even 95 percent, it's a good opportunity to bring in new platforms. Um, where to will be um, essentially a digital corporate platform that um, is starting to be rolled out uh, in the new year. And so certainly by the time business comes back in full force, that will be a major benefit to us. And, and the major benefit will be giving customers a lot more and improving our productivity. And, and the same in, um, in leisure. We, we have a platform we call it Helio Copernicus, and uh, that will integrate a lot more of our product, air and land products, so that it makes it a lot easier for consultants to sell and makes them much more productive. We, we also have an integration platform between um, you know, the various GDSs and uh, leisure and corporate so that um, you know, and some of these things just wouldn't have been possible uh, to integrate as quickly uh, without, um, I suppose, business down to such low levels they are now. So I, I'm not suggesting that um, it's a good idea to have a COVID pandemic, but um, these are some of the little bit of silver lining uh, with that, Huntley. And obviously, uh, this is something that's not just flight centres been battling, but many other travel companies, is uh, the processing uh, of, of refunds and the, and the backlog that uh, some companies are, are suffering. I just wanted to get a sense, how far along is, is flight centre uh, in that regard in terms of processing um, refunds? Um, and, and also, I just wanted to um, find out from you how the, I guess, some of the negative media coverage that's come about uh, around this um, and the handling of refunds, how has it impacted you and your employees and um, business morale there at Flight, Flight Centre and have you done anything to, to combat this? Um, well, look, yeah, refunds have been a major issue and uh, not, not so much because we can't do it, but we're obviously relying on the, um, the tour operators and airlines and cruise companies to refund us. And uh, as most people will know, this happens in a two or three month window. So obviously a lot of customers have been uh, concerned about getting their refunds back quickly, particularly if they had booked and paid uh, some time ahead. Uh, initially, we, we had some trouble um, with, with refunds. We did get a bit of bad press uh, and it's probably, and the reason was pretty simple. Um, we're an organisation that does bookings and uh, travel arrangements. Uh, we're not an organisation that's used to primarily doing refunds. So it took us uh, a month or six weeks to really get our systems right. Uh, our systems are pretty good now. Um, and uh, you know, bear in mind, we've already refunded in Australia, for example, um, about $850 million. Uh, we'll probably have another couple of hundred million to go over the next few months. And then uh, we should be pretty much right. Um, and, and this does vary from country to country. But um, look, I think most, most of our customers have been understanding about this. We put a lot of resources into that. Indeed, um, of our couple of thousand um, leisure consultants that we have at the moment, that's what they've been doing for the last six months. And, uh, you know, and, and, and from a morale point of view, I think generally we've done pretty well. Uh, it, it, it has been, uh, we, we did get some abuse uh, and our consultants did get abused from various times, but uh, that's 
generally stocked. We've got a lot of support in place for them. And um, I think generally for the last four or five months, it's gone pretty well. That's good to hear. Um, now, have you got a bit of a time frame uh, in mind for how long it will take for Flight Centre to recover from the pandemic? And, and how is the company setting itself up so that the company's growth from here on is sustainable? Uh, look, um, we probably feel that, uh, for example, in, uh, in Australia, the domestic borders will open before December. Uh, we certainly hope so. There seems to be no reason why they can't. And that's really important to us because probably half our business is in um, Australia and about half our Australian business in corporate and leisure is domestic, um, even though the margin might be a little bit less, particularly in air. So um, the domestic is going to be really important. Uh, as, as I said, with South Africa, their domestics all been open for a month or six weeks or nearly two months now, I think. And uh, it, it's, um, it's shown a, a big recovery, particularly in leisure there. Uh, obviously, Europe uh, is still a bit of an issue with um, high levels of infection and, and the States too, but they're slowly coming coming back and increasing their revenue month to month. Uh, the, the next major thing will be international. And uh, I think out of Australia with various bubbles, it'll probably be over the next six months, as uh, six or eight months as the um, different bubbles, bilateral arrangements come to, uh, to fruition. And uh, we think the international will start coming back uh, reasonably well about the middle of this year. But obviously, we don't know. Um, this is not so much about the COVID virus. It's about the government reactions and government restrictions to it, which uh, can can be uh, quite illogical. Uh, there's no... Um, and quite unscientific. So you just never know what different governments are going to do. Yeah, uh, but okay. There, I, I was going to say, too... Before things get back to pre-COVID, but we, we think they'll be back to maybe 70 or 80 percent by June 23, and uh, back to pre-COVID levels around um, around uh, June 25. So you know we're 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 looking at this as a five-year, basically a five-year operation, five-year plan. Okay. Now you were talking there about uh, border restrictions. Uh, both at a domestic uh, level and an international uh, level. And I know you've been quite vocal about this in the media um, in, in, in recent times. And I know that you're also a member of Australia's Tourism Restart Task Force. What needs to happen now from both a federal and a state and territory level uh, for the reopening to, to happen across the board? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, like from, from a domestic point of view, uh, the first thing that needs to happen is the uh, the federal government needs to get the states to toe the line and uh, to unite and have the same basic uh, policies and standards. Um, it's There can only be one best way and um, the having seven or eight states and territories all going their own way just doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, so, so that's the main thing. And I think that sort of coordinated approach then, opening those state borders, having the protocols uh, for safe travelling. And um, I, I don't think that'll be a problem. I think most of the states now, the Queensland election's only out of the way. Um, and uh, the, the, the uh, Northern Territory and ACT elections are out of the way that um, common sense will generally prevail domestically. Internationally, it will be a bit harder. I think um, the, the travel industry and um, the uh, Restart Task Force is, is one example of that, working with the federal government in particular to um, you know, establish successful and safe protocols for international travel, initially to the um, to, uh, countries that are considered uh, green or low, very low risk. And uh, but, uh, but I think we have to deal with how we deal with the, the higher risk countries like Europe and the UK and North America. We, we can't ignore them. It just means that the quarantine protocols have to become much um, much much more user-friendly. And I, I think that that's not difficult. 
Yeah, okay. Um, just talking about the countries that Aussies will look to travel to once uh, the international uh, border restrictions are eased, obviously besides New Zealand, what are some of the others that you think Aussies will first of all be able to travel to and also look to travel to once this happens? Yeah, no, good, um, uh, a good question again. I mean, I think there's no doubt that uh, places like Hong Kong and Singapore are, op are opening between each other. Uh, a place like Vietnam has a has a quite a low um, rate of infection, and uh, that that that'll be probably one of the next ones, probably taking over more from uh, places like Indonesia and uh, Thailand in the short term. Uh, Japan, uh, Taiwan, uh, even China. Um, China, the main issue there is whether they'll their government will allow people to come here rather than us letting them in. So. Uh, that, that's probably a really major one, uh, and obviously South Korea. So they're probably the main countries for bilateral tourism uh, in the next, you know, eight months, I'd suggest. Okay. And then in terms of the travel sectors, if we're talking about, you were talking before about leisure and, and, and corporate, um, but also other um, small ones like luxury and stuff, which ones do you expect to bounce back first once international travel uh, regimes and, and which uh, of those might be a, I guess, a slower burn. Yeah, I, I think um, you know um, things like uh, domestic domestic uh, leisure will come back very quickly as soon as people feel not not just safe but that the borders aren't going to shut again every five minutes. And I think that's really important. There is certainty that that you know we're going to have we're going to obviously have more waves and infections in Australia and. Um, even Victoria is going to have their third wave at some stage. It might be three, six or nine months, who knows. But so uh, it's just got to be the certainty that regardless of what happens, uh, the borders are going to stay open. And I think there's no doubt that uh, corporate travel will come come back after leisure in, in domestically. And um, I think um, internationally, it'll probably be leisure first, um, particularly the younger travellers. And, um, yeah, younger travellers. Corporate probably won't come back to pre-COVID levels for some time, but it'll, it'll probably, um, you know, it, a lot of corporate is domestic and short haul. So uh, hopefully, hopefully that will be quite, you know, will make quite a good comeback fairly quickly. So, um, you know, I... I think it will vary quite a bit, but cruising is another one where, you know, <coughs> pardon me. Um, with cruising, I think uh, there's a lot of demand for it and uh, uh, cruisers are very um, loyal and we're getting a lot of bookings, particularly in the My Holidays field already. So it'll come back very quickly once people are allowed to cruise. And, and there are some cruisers as you know, happening in the Mediterranean now. So that will come back as soon as um, cruises are scheduled, I'm sure, and, and it's people are allowed to travel out of Australia. Yeah, okay. And uh, just still on uh, overseas travel, do you think it's going to be more or less expensive to travel overseas post-COVID? Um, look, I, I think it'll even out pretty much uh, fairly similar to pre-COVID once things settle down. Uh, initially, um, you might get some really good deals in the short term, and I think that that will encourage people to book once there's a, you know, some level of certainty that the travel is going to be able to take place. But I think once it settles down and, and flights start returning to a level of normality, it'll be not too dissimilar to pre-COVID uh, prices um, internationally for sure. Okay. Um, one thing that I guess is that the spotlight on it uh, during COVID is uh, travel insurance. What role do you expect uh, it to play in the post-COVID world? And, uh, and also, how can agents provide consumer confidence in selling travel insurance if pandemics or epidemics aren't covered? Yeah, I, you know, the insurance companies will obviously... Um the, the aim of insurance companies, obviously, not to have to pay out all the time. And I think, uh, you know, obviously, Australia has a reasonable number of uh, bilateral arrangements with countries like Italy and, and others. 
Um, and, and in the others, I think there will be a fair bit of flexibility in terms of cancellations and um, uh, transfers and that sort of thing, so that a lot of that risk will tend to be taken by the operators. Um, but in, in the end, uh, I think uh, the travel insurance will need to have some health cover that will cover, um, you know, that will cover their health and hospitalisation at least up to a certain limit in um, in post pandemic world because, uh, you know, that's going to be one of the things people want to, will want to be reasonably happy with. And perhaps there's a role for uh, more bilateral government arrangements um, that do cover off in this, which, which there are already, you know, a, a reasonable number of countries that Australia has those bilaterals with. So uh, hopefully that could be extended as well. Okay. Um, and uh, another uh, concern, I guess, that seems to have uh, many agents worried at the moment uh, is suppliers undercutting them by selling direct. Do you think that's a problem and, and should suppliers be offering more uh, agent-only deals in the current climate? Look, there, there, there's so little travel being uh, booked now, both in leisure and corporate, it's probably not a big, big thing. Um, you, you know, a lot of operators and airlines uh, have a strategy of getting more business direct if they can, uh, but they've got to balance that off against um, upsetting um, intermediaries such as uh, travel agents. And I think you'll find that um, most, most of the suppliers that do rely on the trade to, uh, for a lot of their business will have to toe the line pretty well um, and make sure that the deals at the very least that they give to the industry uh, they don't undercut them, um, despite the fact they do want to have the opportunity to market directly to the custom base as well. So it, it'll vary from supplier to supplier, but um, I think particularly in Australia and New Zealand and a few other countries, uh, the trade, the intermediary trade is very important to most suppliers and um, they've got to be very careful that they don't um, upset them, I believe, because, uh, you know, the concept, it's, it's better getting a... Yeah, to get a direct sale, it costs the suppliers a significant amount of money and, okay, they have to pay us a commission, uh, but I, I think um, it's generally pretty good value. So uh, it, it'll be a mixture of both things. Okay. Uh, I just want to, I guess, stick on uh, some other topics that uh, are relating to agents um, right now. Most agents obviously are rewarded based on how much travel uh, they sell, but given there's not uh, much for agents to sell at the moment, as you mentioned, what can travel agencies and, and suppliers be doing to ensure that the agents feel valued in the current environment? Yeah, I think it's, it's really important that um, agents uh, and the trade generally uh, have a good communication with, with suppliers. And certainly I know from Flight Centre Travel Group, we're trying to make sure that we keep in close contact with our major suppliers, our major airlines, tour operators and cruise lines so that, um, you know, we can work together as as things come back. So I think that's that's really important. And I think um, working together on promotion um, as the industries come back, both domestic initially and then international, is going to be really important. I, I think there's no doubt that with most uh, most businesses, uh, working together on this is going to be more important post-COVID than, than pre. So, uh, and generally from what we see, that's uh, for, in, in most instances, that is what's happening now. Yeah, okay. Can you see uh, the way agents are remunerated at the moment changing in any way in the near future? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, it, it, it varies with leisure and corporate. I, I think with leisure, it'll be fairly similar. Um, with corporate, because um, because obviously we have we do a, a reasonable amount of work with our corporate businesses, whether they're travelling or not, you know, in other words, uh, we do a lot of advice and um, uh, duty of care sort of stuff. There, there may be um, a certain amount of charging, 
that doesn't necessarily relate just to travel, the numbers of bookings, the numbers of travel, but more the amount of work and what we're doing with each other and what they actually want from travel agents because this duty of care is going to be really important in the way uh, uh, corporate uh, businesses uh, allow their people to travel. So there's, there's probably other opportunities there for, um, for corporates to charge for some of these services that may or may not be related to the amount of travel that's done. Yeah, okay. And, um, and how should agents be marketing themselves in the current climate? What, what do you think they should be focusing on uh, right now? Look, without a lot of travel happening, um, we feel it's probably still a little bit early to do too much. There certainly will be, as soon as these Australian borders reopen, there will be quite a bit of demand, although it's hard to see, for example, the Christmas holidays, how much occupancy will be left in certain areas uh, because there's been a fair bit of intrastate uh, promotion and, and, and interest. But, um, I, you know... As a major brand like Flight Centre, we certainly need to do the brand awareness. Um, as soon as we have some certainty the travel's coming back, we don't have a lot of money to spend in marketing, but uh, you know, we'll certainly be um, promoting both our brand and, um, and, and our specific products as soon as we can see uh, light at the end of the uh, domestic and later on the international travel arrangements. Yeah, okay. And, and obviously, flight centres had uh, a few campaigns out recently during the, the pandemic. What's the return on investment been like there? Have you seen uh, any, any change in, in business uh, activity? Look, most of our campaigns have been funded by uh, third parties like tourism bodies and uh, other people like that or, or with um, basic FOC offerings from uh, media. So... Um, uh, but th there has been a reasonable return, uh, considering it didn't cost us anything much. But, um, you know, the, the problem is uh, that there's just not enough uh, product, you know, that we can actually sell yet. Um, but, you know, I think keeping your brand in the marketplace is really important. Uh, and as things come back, uh, people, you know, we, we saw it in just in, I, th I think, um, in uh, the interstate, I think Brisbane to Cairns is the biggest, the most popular route in the Qantas network. And it was up to 130%, I think, quite quickly of pre-COVID levels. So, um, you know, things will come back very quickly once the borders open properly. Yeah. Okay. And um, looking even bigger picture into the future, uh, what does the travel agent of the future look like? Will, will there be a rise in the number of uh, agents working independently or uh, mobile, home-based, and, and, and how much will technology and automation uh, play a role in all this? Yeah, I, I think uh, both things will happen to a certain extent. There'll be more uh, independent, independent contractors. Um, there'll be probably less uh, bricks and mortar, but um, I, I still think bricks and mortar will have a very significant role to play in places like Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, at least. Uh, for the next uh, 10 or 15 years. Uh, there will be more online for simple uh, transactions. So, um, you know, th those, those sort of things will happen. Um, I, I think in the corporate field, uh, managed travel will become even more important with, um, with the safety concerns uh, that, and the duty of care that companies will have for that. So, you know, generally, I think for the industry, the intermediate uh, industry, it'll be... Um, It'll be quite a positive note. Yep. Okay. And um, and just moving back to a, a question uh, around uh, Flight Centre, uh, I remember in one of your recent uh, ASX uh, statements, you mentioned that uh, Flight Centre would be looking to capitalise on industry consolidation. Uh, how is that going to look like? Uh, or what is it going to look like? And, and uh, is it just a simple case of... Uh, taking up the, the space that's being vacated by, um, by other brands? Well, you know, it's very hard to see um, what the um, runway's going to be like in terms of time. But, um, and, and uh, 
you know, I, I've said clearly for the last six months, um, we, we've been in, and like I think nearly everyone else in the industry, been in survival mode because, um, and it's not clear who's going to survive and who's not, but um, we're quite, you know, we're, we're happy. We, we have a, a three-year runway to a cash runway liquidity. Not everyone will be in that position, but, but quite a few will be. Um, and I think uh, the really important thing is to look at what happens when, um, as travel opens up again, and to make sure we can take advantage of that, at least retain our prior market share, if not perhaps grow it, depending on what the opportunities are. So um, we're not necessarily looking at a lot of acquisitions unless it's strategic. Uh, because we, we, we have the, the resources currently, I think, to grow back to where we were pre-COVID uh, with, without um, changing dramatically. So, yeah, there might be a change of models a bit from a bit of offline to online, but uh, it's it really the key thing for us is um, you know, travel coming back and us being able to take advantage of uh, making sure we can get our fair share of that. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you about Australia's aviation sector. There's uh, a lot going on uh, at, the, at the moment. How do you see Qantas, Virgin and Jetstar and, of course, Rex as well uh, playing a part in the future of uh, Australia's aviation industry and uh, particularly where, where do you expect to see Virgin uh, positioned in all of this coming out of administration? Uh, look, you know, certainly uh, domestically, I think, um, you know, Qantas is probably in the box seat a bit with uh, Qantas brand and, and, and Jetstar. Um, there's still a long way to go to get domestic flying, of course. Uh, I, I, it's very hard to see what, what um, exactly what Rex is going to do. Um, but, you know, they, they have been talking about flying some of the mainline routes. Uh, certainly Virgin, um, I'm, uh, I, I certainly have been talking to Paul Scarra and, uh, and other people there recently. There, there's no doubt that um, it's going to be a middle of the road carrier. It's not going to be a low cost. It's going to cater for, you know, particularly SME business as well as the leisure. Uh, so we will be competing with Qantas as well as with Jetstar. And um, It'll certainly be a smaller airline. Uh, they, you know, the private equity that own them are um, obviously they're looking at a three to five year window, I presume, as most private equity does, and uh, they'll be keen to get it back into a profit as soon as possible. So um, I, I think, um, you know, the, the, the overall scenario in the domestic um, airline industry is going to be changed. Um, and it's a bit early to say exactly how that is, but I think having the two major carriers back, uh, Qantas obviously will um, will probably see that they have um, yeah they have the inside running, but um, certainly from what I've seen of Virgin, they they're keen to uh, make sure that although they will be smaller, that they'll uh, still be quite an effective second player. And and I I really don't know about Rex. So I'm not sure what. What will be the outcome there at all? Okay, interesting. Um, what leadership lessons have you learned from the COVID nineteen pandemic, and and what advice do you have for those in the travel industry trying to rebuild their businesses? Look, I think um, you know I, I've been in business since nineteen seventy three. We, we started Top Deck and and flights you know, since 1982. And um, this has been by, heart, by far the toughest period. Uh, I think um, the business leadership in, in travel and during this period, whether it's in airports, airlines, tourism, or in, uh, in leisure corporate travel, um, the first thing is you've got to survive it. It's no use being in business unless you can survive it. And you've got to survive it with the right people there um, and the right people are obviously not just leadership, it's, um, it's the right frontline people that can deliver a great service and product to your customers. Um, uh, from a leadership point of view, I think uh, you just got to focus on those things and, and accept there's going to be a lot of tough decisions. 
Um, there's going to have to be a lot of people uh, initially stood down, later on made redundant, and you've got to be fair to them as possible and, um, and uh, give them a chance to uh, get on with their lives uh, but with the same opportunity to come back if, if that's what they want to do as, as travel comes back. So I, I think it's, it is about um, making tough decisions but trying to be as fair as possible with it and, um, and making sure that you look after your, your frontline assets in particular because they're the people that make you the money, they're the people that do the sales, they're the people that look after the customers. So those are the really major things. Um, it, it's, it's, important to, um, to, to, it's important to us certainly to presume that travel is going to come back, uh, but uh, it's not going to be quick. It's going to be, you know, so it's, it's about having a, um, a, a, run, um, a runway that you can live with over the next uh, two or three years. Finally, my last question. Uh, a lot of people are, are dreaming of where they want to travel to uh, next when they go overseas uh, and are able to take a holiday. Where do you want to travel to once? Port is rare. Um, well, I'm looking at, uh, obviously, as a, I said before, we've got, um, we're in 23 countries, uh, many of which are run by, uh, from uh, London, for the EMEA market and uh, from New York in the uh, North American market, which is Canada, the USA and Mexico. And um, so I'm pretty keen to get over there. I'm hoping to go in December. Um, and, uh, you know, there's still a bit of, um, there's a few ma minor problems getting there at the moment, but uh, that's, uh, that's, that's probably the uh, New, New York and London, uh, which I'm... Uh, I'm planning for at the moment, so we'll see how we go. Oh, well, let's hope let's hope you get there, and uh, and that we're all able to take a much deserved holiday very soon. Screw, thank you so much for your time today. I, I really appreciate all of uh, your insights into Flight Centre and also the the travel industry uh, at large. Uh, it's a pleasure, Huntley. Thank you. Awesome, and and thanks also to all of you who uh, tuned in today. We hope that you gain some useful knowledge and advice that you can apply to your own business recovery. Uh, bye for now.